Hello everyone. Uh, this is going to be a different kind of video. It's one which may be turned into a bit of a series and it involves criticisms of psychology, in particular uh, uh, clinical psychology. So I have uh, mixed feelings about my chosen profession. On the one hand, there's what it aspires to be or what it has the potential to, to be, uh, to help people alleviate suffering, to help people live as, as much as possible in the truth, to bear the truth to whatever extent possible. That's a Nietzschean sort of uh, way of coming at it, who is the, you know, the, the godfather of all psychology, arguably, right? One of the greatest psychologists uh, to have ever existed, although he, he is largely uh, referred to as a philosopher. Uh, helping people gain insight into themselves to understand why they think and act in some of the ways that they do, to help them, you know, challenge themselves, to help them become more of who they actually are, to help them appropriate their agency and exercise their free will to maximize their potential. All of this is, is a beautiful thing and just the layers and depth and uh, the, the, the challenges that go along with just trying to understand the human condition, human consciousness, all of that. To me, it, it's just such a, a humbling and challenging and beautiful, you know, domain to be working within. Uh, so on the one hand, all of that I believe in my heart of hearts to be absolutely true. On the other hand, there's what psychology looks like in practice, what it tends to be, what uh, in general it, 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 you know, what it looks like. And that's not to say that there aren't exceptions, of course. I think there are great psychologists out there. I think there are you know, interesting people who are doing uh, in-depth work and of high sophistication and so on. Um, but I, I don't think that that's, by and large, what tends to happen. Psychology in practice, to me, uh, it tends to be quite dogmatic. It tends to be susceptible to fashions and fads um, you know, whatever is, is popular in the, in the culture at a given time. Um, it just moves through these, these different, you know, paradigms or frameworks without a whole lot of coherency to it. So, you know, the, we'll move through something like phrenology to psychoanalysis to behaviorism where that's, you know, seen as, as the, the capital T truth of how to understand people and so on. And then you have like cognitivism where you have the metaphor of, you know, the, the, the computer and information processing, and maybe that's how the mind works and so on. And then you move on to the next thing. And currently I would say that we're in some kind of uh, intersectional theory, critical race theory, you know, this idea that, uh, that people are best understood as, you know, members of, of a, a group, a category, a class. And then you have the oppressor oppressed, you know, classes and, and they're leveraging the, the oppressors are using their power to, unconsciously, perhaps, to leverage, uh, you know, their interests and and advantages against those who are less fortunate and the marginalized and all the rest of it. So it's very much a Marxist, communist set of assumptions. Instead of uh, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, you have the, uh, again, the oppressed oppressor type thing, and that's based on your your race, gender, sexuality, and so on, and all of this stuff through all these different paradigms, all these different, you know, uh, movements in psychology, it is largely, you know, uncritical of itself. It is largely unself-reflective and it purports uh, to, to be more objective than it in fact is. And so this is, you know, what we're going to get into here today. So hopefully this is going to be interesting. Now, before I get any further, I should mention that, um, uh, within, I'm a Canadian psychologist. I have a master's degree, by the way. I don't have a PhD, so whatever that means to you, um, I am practicing in a province where I, I have the designation of psychologist. I've, I've taught university courses for over a decade. I no longer do. Um, and I'm now in, in full time clinical practice. But uh, my Canadian Code of Ethics for psychologists. Um, ha is made up of four different ethical standards, one of which is a responsibility to society. And subsumed under that, there are you know, clauses or, or guidelines that uh, suggest that we ought to uh, 
uh, be critical and self-reflective of our profession, particularly as it as it relates to uh, society and what may be beneficial or harmful to society and so on. So I, I believe that I'm on solid ethical grounds to offer these criticisms of my own profession. Uh, lots of people have done this in, in you know, previous uh, you know, decades, of course, I'm by no means a, a trailblazer in that sense. Um, so if anyone, if, if their, their feathers are ruffled and whatnot, uh, because they don't agree with what I have to say, or uh, they're upset and, you know, make all kinds of assumptions, you know, again, I, I think I'm on solid ground in uh, making some of these statements. Now, uh, and this is just my opinion, right? But why, why is psychology susceptible to these, these fads or fashions? Um, you know, these, these dogmatic ways of thinking where they don't realize just the, you know, the, the, the problems in, in the frameworks that they're operating within. Part of the issue, in my opinion, and this is after decades of uh, research in, you know, the philosophy of science and psychology, um, part of the problem is that psychology purports to be a science. Um, it believes that just because it does empirical research at times, usually involving surveys and questionnaires and, and things of that nature, uh, sometimes more behavioral experiments and, and whatnot, but it believes that it is akin to something like biology, chemistry, physics, uh, practical physics, um, and, and so on. And in my opinion, it is absolutely, and in the opinion of many others, it's not, it can't be, right? So in the hard sciences, what you have is a situation where the researcher or the investigator um, is taking up a, a disinterested attitude toward the object of study. And the object is often something that is uh, somewhat more tangible, uh, something like a, a particle, some materiality, uh, a, a gas, vapors, uh, you know, something that, that can be measured objectively and understood within a causal framework that doesn't really deviate beyond, uh, you know, what we typically think of with causation, which is uh, material efficient causation if you're into Aristotle. Um, but even so, even within the hard sciences, you still have, you know, certain assumptions, um, auxiliary hypotheses, terms, meanings, and so on that are lurking in the backdrop uh, and that provide a little bit of structure for that framework that allows you to interpret, you know, the evidence and, and judge it as, as such. Um, and, and this is often taken for granted, right? So even in the hard sciences, it's not entirely objective. There's always a set of theor theoretical assumptions operating in the background that are taken as, as true or as valid, or there are auxiliary hypotheses that remain untested uh, in that scientific uh, endeavor. So if this, you know, just sounds bizarre or weird, I mean, people have usually heard of the term paradigm shift, okay? Paradigm shift has, was coined or popularized by Thomas Kuhn, who wrote the book the Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And what he noted is that, you know, scientific paradigms, they work almost like, like cults or religions, where all these different assumptions are taken for granted. Nobody questions them. And, um, and so long as, as the data can fit within that framework, it, it's seen as evidence for the framework. And then what happens eventually in the hard sciences is that you have data points that are no longer interpretable or understandable within that framework. And then it reaches a point of crisis where a competing paradigm that is able to account for those missing data points, it starts to gain traction and the old paradigm eventually collapses. But it's not like the, the old scientists, you know, give up their paradigm. That's usually not what happens. It's usually that those people get old and die. You know, they, they're, again, like the, the, the religious dogmatists or, uh, you know, the, 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 the cult fanatics or something. And then, you know, the new paradigm comes in. Now that's in the hard sciences, what I'm just describing. That's like chemistry, biology, and so on. Now, how is psychology different? Psychology is profoundly different precisely because the object of inquiry, the thing that you're trying to understand, is not a thing at all. It's not like a, a particle or a gas or something that you can investigate under 
you know, a microscope or look through a telescope and completely capture all of what that is. Of course, we have a neurophysiological, biological constitution, but that does not en encompass the whole of what a human is. The human is not an object. The human is a subject. And the subject, the individual, who has a first person what it's like to be as such, unlike a rock or a potato, <laughs> we have values and virtues that we embody and meaning horizons and moral sensibilities. We exist in time, we can recall the past, we can anticipate the future, we have our agency that we can exercise. All of this makes it much more complex and multi-layered and not something that is going to be understood completely uh, from an objective, disinterested frame. It just can't, and there's a lot to get into there, but I, I won't. Um, and what this means, though, is that psychologists, much more than you know, the biologists, are going to rely even more so on theory and concepts and metaphors and all these different terms and categories that are taken for granted, the nested assumptions, auxiliary hypotheses, all of these things are going to be much more relevant or at play in the social sciences. And the problem is that in order for, in my opinion, and the opinion of many, in order to have some approximation to the truth, you have to be not only a good scientist, a good researcher, a good investigator, and so on, but you also have to be skilled in detecting those assumptions, in questioning those underlying premises. You know, is it, is it a sound argument? Is it a valid argument? Does, you know, what, what should we be questioning or challenging or noticing in, in some of these terms that we're employing, the metaphors that we're using? Are they appropriate? Are they inappropriate? And the problem is that, you know, what I'm describing is essentially doing philosophy. So the, the, the true psychologist has to be a blend, a mix of objective scientist and, you know, metaphysician or, or philosopher. Most psychologists uh, will have never taken a philosophy course. There are, of course, you know, exceptions. So don't chime in in the comments, oh, I'm one of those people, and so on and so forth. Most psychologists have not taken coursework in philosophy. They have not taken coursework in basic logic. Certainly they have not taken coursework uh, in theory construction as part of their, their program. And so we're much more likely to just gloss over these things and not notice these different assumptions that we're making. And this makes the, the profession as a whole very prone to dogma and uh, getting caught up in, in these different movements, sometimes fanatical ones. <clears throat> and this has dire consequences potentially for society as well. Now here's a thought experiment I want to leave you with. And I sincerely want to hear people's uh, thoughts and comments on this, okay? I want you to imagine that um, a psychologist, doesn't have to be a psychologist, but imagine that there's a psychologist who is practicing uh, in you know, early 1940s Germany during the rise of you know, that fanatical movement, the demagoguery and propaganda, all that kind of stuff. And, and, or imagine that that, that psychologist is you know, in 1920s you know, Soviet Russia during the rise of Lenin or you know, during Stalin. Or imagine that another totalitarian system in China, Mao Zedong's cultural movement and all the the, the stuff going along with that. Imagine that a psychologist is working within a culture that, that is going through all of that, okay? Now, do you think that if, if someone, if someone who, who realized the propaganda, the, the, the problem, what was happening to their society, do you think that that person, you know, and, and a good example is you see that, that picture that we've all seen, I think, of the, you know, the National Socialist Rally, Everyone's given their, their salutes, and there's the one guy with his arms crossed like this, and you can tell he's just not buying it. Imagine that guy went to therapy and, and, and met with just the average psychologist at that time. Do you think that that psychologist would, would sympathize with this person? This person is like, God, I'm having an existential crisis. This society just went nuts. 
I don't know what all these people are believing. It, it just seems crazy to me. You know, everyone's lost their minds. Do you think that the average psychologist is going to be sympathetic and is going to draw attention to this and, you know, I, I, be the first to see it and so on? Or do you think that that psychologist is going to buy into the same crap as almost everyone else and that that psychologist may maybe unconsciously nudge this person back into, well, you know, the Fuhrer has done this and he's done that and he's, you know, and that, and that kind of thing. Or imagine again, imagine this is happening in, in uh, Soviet Russia. Do you think, do you think that that psychologist, on average, I'm just saying average, there are lots of people that did wake up, they emigrated out of these countries and so on, but that, that's not, <laughs> that wouldn't be the norm. You know, would that psychologist in communist Russia would they uh, be sympathetic again to, you know, rumors of, of the Holodomor and all, all these terrible things that are happening and people starving and, and uh, the abuses and propaganda and, you know, and whatnot? Or do you think this psychologist would probably report this person, you know, to uh, the, the Blue Caps, the NKVD, whatever, the, you know, because I, I think that's what would happen. I really do. And, and now... Now, suppose, not saying that we are, suppose we were going through some kind of mass psychosis where people were just losing their grip on reality and our governments were, you know, just spreading propaganda relentlessly. And if someone was awake to that sort of thing and went to see a psychologist, do you think the psychologist would be sympathetic or do you think the psychologist would say or think this person's a conspiracy theorist? Because right? that's what we do nowadays to dismiss people. Oh, they're either a conspiracy theorist or if they don't agree with the narrative, then uh, they're, they're a bad person somehow. They're beyond the moral pale or, or something like that. That's how these totalitarian, totalitarian movements work. I've been thinking a lot, by the way, about and researching, reading a lot about mass psychology, totalitarianism, communism, and, and so on. Uh, for good reason, I, I think, although most people wouldn't wouldn't uh, understand that I don't think but I want to know what, what's your opinion like do you think do you think psychology is a completely objective uh, you know uh, science that is able to to be a, a safeguard to uh, the citizens the society at, at large or do you think that we're just as likely as anyone else to get swept up in some form of dogma and in fact when someone who no longer fits with the society because society becomes sick. When someone doesn't fit anymore, do you think the average psychology is going to hear this person or are they gonna take a rubber mallet and try to pound them back into that, that peg hole? You know, so they, they, they can fit with the society, whether it's sick or whether it's, it's ill. <laughs> I, th I think I know the answer to those questions for myself. Anyway, I hope you found this insightful. Uh, give the video a like if, if you wouldn't mind. Subscribe to the channel if you hadn't, hadn't and uh, share this with other people who may be interested. All right, take care. We'll talk again soon. Bye.